research is primarily media, but uh, the last decade or so, I've been paying a lot of attention to the way that media are operating financial markets. Um, and that's led me to ask quite a, a series of quite intricate questions about the, the nature of financial markets and how they work and how they don't work, and the way in which what goes on in the global financial world uh, actually has quite a serious impact on the everyday life of ordinary people. So uh, if you'll bear with me for maybe uh, half an hour, I'll, uh, I'll try and explain some of the ideas that relate to this. And if anybody's got questions as we go along or if you just get bored, uh, you know, yell out, let me know, ask questions along the way, okay? So I guess, uh, I guess the financial crisis is it's a bit hard to conceive. We know that there's one that's happened, but what were, what were its broader impacts? Well, the figures I've got suggest that about $12 trillion were wiped out in financial value. You know, 12 million million dollars, you know, roughly between 2008 and 2009, you know, when the major crisis was happening. Uh, coincidentally, I also found out that about $12 trillion of taxpayer money has been transferred to the banking system from governments. <laughs> and guess who's paying the bill for that? Yep, us. If you think that sucks, put your hand up. <laughs> oh great, well we've got a consensus for the afternoon. Jolly good. Now, it's not just, not just left-wing activists that think this. Uh, McKinsey Global Institution, big financial analyst corporation, uh, they're actually very interesting. They've got a lot of good stuff online. Uh, quote, it says, These large debts represent the significant transfer of wealth from future generations to today's populations and will be a drag on growth as they're paid down in the future. Okay? So this isn't just, you know, this isn't just the, the 99 speaking out, this is the 1% recognising that there's issues here. So I've got a little thought experiment that I thought I'd uh, throw at you. I mean, I suppose everyone dreams of winning the lottery. What, 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 if, what would happen if everyone won the lottery? What would happen if everybody became a millionaire? Not worth a thing. Well, I think you're absolutely right. It, it wouldn't be worth a thing. If everyone had exactly the same amount of money, if we all had millions in the bank, well, you might think for a day or two you'd be living in the lap of luxury. Of course, when you got up on Monday morning, no one else would be at work. The buses wouldn't be running because the bus driver would be at the beach enjoying their millions, except they couldn't get to the beach because all the buses weren't running. <laughs> You know, it, it would be a rather curious scenario. So, so what's money? Well, you know, what's the nature of money? Well, where does it come from? What's it for? You know, how does it get in your pocket? Any bets? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I'm going to run an experiment then. Uh, since, since I don't really have very much money, I decided to create the Bank of Peter. Um, so, I, I, I've recently become fabulously wealthy. In fact, I've got loads of money. I've got millions. Um, the only trouble is, pack and save won't take it, BP won't take the stuff. Uh, I may as well give it away, quite frankly. You know, so, you're all millionaires by the Bank of Peter. Now, I, I'm a bit bemused. It's a piece of paper. What's different from that piece, between that piece of paper and this piece of paper? I mean, the both pieces of paper. You no longer need the one in your hand because you have your own currency. Well, but. So but you have to give that away now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I could afford to. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I will. I don't know. Does anyone want to burn this? Yes. Okay. You, you have a cigarette lighter? Uh, bring it over here. Okay. Bring it over here. Okay, this could be an inter interesting exercise in the uh, destruction of fictitious. Oh, it's just gone off. Come in here and do it. And we will I will enjoy the, the smell green. of plastic. <laughs> oh, can I have that without yeah, right. it? No, it's not. <laughs> it's sort of plastic. It's, it's, it's sort of plastic. Right. It's yeah. a mirror right there. Don't burn the I'm defacing the queen. I've actually always wanted to do this. <laughs> I'm actually Jewish. He's the first person that's ever done this when I've offered the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just burned my money. <laughs> no, well, actually, burned my money. <laughs> But hey, it was worth it to make the point of it. But what, what 
what's been destroyed there? Was it just a piece of paper that got burned? The percentage you'll pay. Well, yeah, okay, it's a bit of my salary. Um, quite a bit of my salary. But, <laughs> but what, what's, what's gone from the world? What can't we do now? Nothing. I mean, if, if, if it's just a piece of paper, how come that one isn't as useful? Because we don't choose to honour it. Right. If, 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 if the other people need to recognise it as money, there's no point everybody having their own monetary system. You can all set up your own bank. But the trouble is if the currency that you're, you're, you're putting out isn't recognised by other people as a, as a legitimate form of payment, then you've got a problem. You know, you, it, it's no use to anybody. It's just a piece of paper. Just as if it was Zimbabwean you know, dollars or something like that. It would, you know, it wouldn't be recognised as legal tender. So there, therein lies the problem. You know, the, the nature of money depends on mutual recognition of its legitimacy and its use as, as, a, as a store of value, as a, as a medium of transaction, and, a, and in the final instance as a means of payment. You've got to have the guarantee that someone who's offering a product will accept that in return for goods and services. So where does the money come from? Well, there's a little story about this. It's about, you may well know it. It's about the king and the charlatan. Okay? The charlatan turns up at the palace and he demands an audience with the king. And the guards say, well, you, know, you look a bit of a dodgy character. Why don't you let you see the king? And the charlatan says, because I will make the king ten times as rich as he is now. Oh, so the guards, well, the king might be interested in that. So they let the charlatan in. So the, the charlatan gets an audience with the king. The king says, okay, well, I'm pretty busy running the kingdom. What, what's this about? He says, well, your majesty, I can make your wealth ten times the size that it is now. Okay? And in return, I want the hand of the princess and half your kingdom. <laughs> what says the king? You know, that's preposterous. How much do you say? Well, at least ten times, your majesty. He said, okay, here's the deal. If you can increase my wealth tenfold, you can marry the princess. Okay? And if you can't... Your head's coming off. Okay, says the charlatan. Here's how it works. Okay? How much gold do you got in the box? Well, quite a lot. Well, come on, you know. Well, a million gold pieces. Great. So now, gold is pretty heavy, isn't it? You know, and when you go shuffling it around, um, you know, actually that's quite inconvenient. You get Robin Hoods who try and nick the stuff. You know, it's heavy and it takes time. Actually, it's far easier, isn't it, if you just write a note promising that whenever anyone presents that note at the palace, that they're going to get the gold. Well, absolutely, says the king. In fact, once I've signed it, it's as good as gold. There you go, says the charlatan. How often do people bring the notes back and demand the gold? Well, actually not that often, says the king. He says, so, if you've got a million gold pieces in your vault, okay, how about you write 10 million pieces of promissory notes. Yeah. How, how about you promise 10 times the wealth? Because you know that 90% of the time, they're not going to come back and ask for the gold. Because once it's got your royal seal on your majesty, it's as good as gold. Welcome to fractional reserve banking. <laughs> this is how the banks create money. What? The banks create money? Wait a minute, we thought the government produces money. Well, the government might produce the green stuff and the metal in your pocket. That's probably about, you know, something like 2 or 3 percent of the overall money supply. The vast majority of money that gets created is created through the issuance of debt by banks. And how do they do it? Well, you go to the bank, they simply transfer the electrons into the account. You, you accept that as a debt on which you have to pay interest. And bingo, money exists. It's pretty simple. But wait a minute, you can't do that, and I can't do that. If I've got ten, well, if I haven't got $20 in my pocket, somebody burned it. But <laughs> if I had $20 in my pocket, I could lend you $20. If I was a bank, though, I could probably stick that in the vault and issue, on the basis of that reserve, up to $200. Now, wouldn't that be a neat party trick? Well, I'll give you a quote, and you can try and guess who said it. Okay? The modern banking system manufactures money out of nothing. The process is perhaps the most astounding piece of sleight of hand 
that was ever invented. Banking was conceived in iniquity and born in sin. The bankers own the earth. If you take it away from them, but leave them with the power to create credit, then with a stroke of a pen, they will create enough money to buy back again. If you want to be slaves of the bankers and pay the costs of your own slavery, then let the bankers create money. Amazing quote, I think. Sounds awfully familiar. You know, governments are cutting public welfare and spending. We're paying off the costs of the bank bailout. Who do you think said that quote? Keynes? Keynes? Kind of close. Jefferson. Jefferson, no, actually, that's a pretty good guess, actually. Churchill? Uh, no, it wasn't Churchill. Okay, okay, well, you're on the right track, but actually, you might be surprised. It's Lord Josiah Stamp the head of the Bank of England during the Depression. <laughs> so one of the one of the one percenters, I think you might say, is saying this. Okay, this isn't this isn't what one of the monetary theorists, this is the guy in charge of the system saying it's a scam. Okay? Well, what more proof do you need? So I think that the, the big issue here is the private control over the creation of credit and, and money. Okay? Government bonds get bought by banks. Okay? So when the banks, when the government needs to raise money, it goes to the banks and it sells a bond. The bond is an IOU, a bit like the king issuing the promissory note. But in this case, the banks are the ones that are issuing the money. They're the ones issuing the notes and it's payable back to the banks. Now the debt levels that governments have taken on you know, have increased enormously. I mean, in a ratio to GDP, New Zealand's debt between 2008 and 2010 went up by, by 10% as a ratio of our GDP, about five, $5 billion. We weren't badly affected. Quite a bit of that was just additional borrowing. Substantial amount of that went into the guarantees for bank assets that have propped up companies like, uh, well, you know, the, the Canterbury Finance and, and the other banks that have basically made a lot of money out of having their guarantees guaranteed by us. So I, I think there's some very, very interesting arguments there about the way that government's austerity packages and the Occupy movements around the globe against all the cuts to public services and the cuts to pensions and the cuts to services are really being driven by this squeeze on governments. And the governments have actually borrowed from the banks who created the money for the governments to borrow to give to the banks to rescue them. And if you think there's something weird about that, well, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll stop thinking I'm crazy. It's, it's the biggest scam in history. That bailout is a hundred times bigger than the Marshall Plan that, that basically rebuilt Europe after World War II. You know, you know, Marshall Plan was one of the biggest, biggest investment schemes in history. You know, this is a hundred times bigger. So big, nobody bothers to report it. It's, Almost, almost too big to conceptualize. Now it's interesting, there's been a huge growth of financial asset value since about the, the late 1970s. In fact, in 1980, global financial assets were about $12 trillion. Okay? And that was about 109% of, of world gross domestic product, okay? world GDP. Okay? That's the, the industrial economy, the goods and services that we actually use. So you know, it was a little bit like. By 2006, that had risen to, to about $167 trillion worth of value, which was about 348% of world GDP. This is what Alan Greenspan referred to as, as irrational exuberance. Now, we go back to what happened to say if everybody's a millionaire. Well, if everyone's a millionaire, well, we might all be equal, but, but we're not all going to live a life of luxury. Because we just get massive inflation. Your bus ticket would cost thousands of dollars, wouldn't it? Well, how come then we've got a world where financial assets have grown so enormously out of proportion to the industrial economy? 